Yes. Anyhow, we've got some fun stuff coming up. But for tonight, we've got a series of three, a three-part series uh, called Fusion Future. Fusion Future. Now, what is all that about? Um, that is all about what we want to be as a youth ministry, as a youth group. What do we want to be? What do we want to be uh, for the future? And in order to be that in the future, we want to start making those changes now. Uh, so these are three foundational things that um, really, uh, no exaggeration, I believe that the Lord put these things on my heart. Um, in June, I will be my third year here, so I haven't really been here that long. Some of you have been, yeah, thank you very much. Some of you have been here like your entire lives, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 years, and to some, some even more than that. Um, incredible. So I'm, I'm a newcomer here. Uh, but um, I do believe in my heart of hearts, heart of hearts, what does that even mean? That means like down deep inside. I believe that God called me to this place. And when he did, I believe that he laid these three things on my heart for Fusion Youth Ministry. And uh, these are things that really Pastor Brian was already doing anyways. I don't know that he had them organized like this, but uh, this is what I believe that the Lord put on my heart. These are the three things. Real simple. Prayer, proclamation, and practice. Those are the three. So we'll be covering those three over the next three weeks. Tonight is obviously prayer, but prayer, proclamation, which means proclaiming God, and then practice, practicing what we preach, practicing what we learn. Okay, so tonight, prayer, let's look at Luke chapter 18. We're going to look at some verses there as we answer these questions as you're opening up to Luke 18. Number one, what is prayer? Number two, why should I pray? Number three, how should I pray? Four, where and when should I pray? Does God hear and answer my prayers? And then lastly, can anything stop my prayers? Or are they just like unstoppable. So we'll look at that. Luke chapter 18, picking it up at verse 9 is where we will start. And we see this uh, uh, Jesus sharing the story. Verse 9, also he, that's Jesus, also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and at the same time despised others. Sounds like the Pharisee from that uh, that episode that we got on Saturday, if you were at the one-day event, sounds like the same type of thing. Verse 10, he says this, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Okay. Now, just so you know, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day, some of them. There were mainly Pharisees and Sadducees. There were also scribes, but uh, the Pharisees were one of the main, main uh, religious leaders. And then tax collectors were absolutely hated by the uh, Jews because the tax collectors um, were oftentimes Jews themselves working for the Roman government. And what would happen is Melissa would come to my gate as she's coming into the city and maybe I'm there and I'm a Jew but I'm a tax collector working for the Romans and Melissa comes, and she's a Jew. And uh, what would happen is I would say, "Okay, what do you what do you have to uh, you know to to uh, claim here as you're coming into town? Okay, you've got a sweatshirt, you know, you got some food, you've got you know stuff with you, some some goods, and I would tax you for everything that you were bringing in." But the Romans gave me freedom as a tax collector to charge her really whatever I wanted, as long as I collected what the Romans required from her for the items that she's bringing in, I could charge her above and beyond that. So you can imagine a lot of the tax collectors were wealthy people because they had the Roman government, the backing of the Roman government, and they could just steal money from people all day long. So they were hated oftentimes by their own people, by the Jews. You know, we might say for good reason, but the, the, the setting is this, is Jesus is telling this parable, okay? And some people say, well, it's a parable, it's not really true. But obviously Jesus is using it to, uh, to teach some, some valuable real-life lessons here, okay? There's a Pharisee and a tax collector. So right away the setting is Pharisee, religious leader, lofty, uh, you know, good, good person. And then the tax collector, boo, hiss, boo, nobody likes those guys. 
And in verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, what we just read, what Jesus just shared with us in that pharisaical prayer, wasn't that a fancy word, pharisaical? I don't even know if that's right. I think it's a word. This was the picture of corrupt prayer. We'll look closely at that, a little closer at that as we move on. But look at verses 13 and 14 where we see correct prayer. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. So the tax collector was justified rather than the Pharisee, the religious leader. And then he says in the second part of verse 14, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, Jesus is teaching this valuable lesson. He just told us what the lesson is in verse 14. If you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. But if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. But we learn some things in here about prayer. Real simple, what is prayer? Well, notice in verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Who was the Pharisee praying with or to? Who was it? Himself. He begins to talk to himself. Whereas the tax collector, verse 13, look what the tax collector, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. Now, why did he not even want to raise his eyes to heaven? Anybody want to take a wild guess, Zach? Because he felt that he was unworthy. Spot on. Uh, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now listen, what exactly is prayer? Well, the Pharisee was communicating with himself. It was a corrupt prayer. The tax collector, however, had the correct prayer, and from that we learn that prayer is real simple. It's communication with God. Prayer is communication with God. God is speaking to us through his word. We speak to him in our prayer lives. Okay? Now, here's the next question. Okay? Moving right along. Still in verse 1 of chapter 18. Why should I pray? Did you have a question? Yes, sir. Go ahead. How do we know if we're doing prayer or not? Well, uh, we're going to talk some more about that, about why it was the wrong kind of prayer. But what you don't want to do is not model your prayer. Man, did you just ask me a question and no, then no, check no. out of me, man? No, I didn't. I did it. I just, I just saw a funny face that someone made. And it kind of the wrong kind of prayer is when you're not praying to God. You'll notice that the tax collector was not even addressing God. We're going to look at it here in just a moment. We'll, we'll get to that and we'll answer your question uh, uh, a little more fully. But let's ask this next question. Why should I pray? Well, look at verse 1 of Luke chapter 18. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always, and it's, I, it's, I'm telling you that it's safe to put women in there also, okay? It's not just the guys, okay? Because, hey, somebody's got to pray for the guys. Huh. If the women aren't doing it, who's going to do it? The guys aren't going to do it. Then he spoke a parable to them. That men always ought to pray and not lose heart. So why should I pray? Well, Jesus said there that people ought to pray. So Jesus said to, number one, simple. Second one, why should I pray? Well, here's the second one, because Jesus did himself. You don't have to turn there, I'll read it for you, but if you're taking notes and you want to write this down, John 17, 1. Jesus spoke these words lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. So you see Jesus praying there. And I, and I would know, just a little side note, and one of my weird little things, and then we'll move on. He actually lifted up his eyes to heaven. Didn't close his eyes, but looked up to heaven. Okay? 
Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said. So why should we pray? Well, I should pray because Jesus said to. But I should, I should also pray because Jesus prayed. And man, if Jesus prayed, if Jesus needed to pray, then you better bet that I need to pray also and, and should be praying. Okay? There's a third reason here. Jesus promised joy. John 16, verses 23 and 24 say this. And in that day, you will ask me nothing, Jesus says. Not a trip? In that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So why should I pray? The third reason is because Jesus promised joy when we do pray. You'll note here in that, in that passage that I just read from John 16, 23, and 24, that he says, listen, whatever uh, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Now, some people have seen that as, oh, man, I really want a Lambo, man. Uh, I, I, I'm going to start praying for one of those and asking the Father for one. The key is at the end of verse 23... Whatever you ask the Father in my name, meaning, it's like, can you really ask God the Father for a Lamborghini in the name of Jesus? In the name of Jesus means that I'm asking for the glory of Jesus, that I'm asking uh, with the authority of Jesus. So, so when I think, well, you know, this is like, oh man, you know, it's like a genie here. And I could just ask for whatever I want. That's not what Jesus is teaching. What he is teaching is that, listen, if you're asking according to God's will, he says, God the Father is going to give you that. In verse 24, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So in other words, what Jesus is saying is, is that prayer is, it equates to power. That through prayer, I have power or I have the resources of God at my disposal, really. You're still in Luke chapter 18. Look at it here in verse 11. I want to ask you a question before we do that. Verse 11. Who was the Pharisee counting on here? Look at verse 11. And this is where we answer the rest, the rest of Noah's prayer, or uh, question about prayer. He asked, how do we know if we're actually praying to the Father or not? Well, I want you to count with me how many times, okay, follow along. You tell me how many times the word I is in here. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. How many eyes? Five. Five. <laughs> Excellent job. Now, in verse 11, this Pharisee addressed God. He said the name of God, but that's not really who he was praying to. He actually was praying with himself, praying to himself. What he was doing essentially is in his prayer time, he was using it to pat his own back. Like, man, I am such a great guy. I do all of these wonderful things, and I'm not like that nasty old tax collector over there. He's so gross. So he's praying not to God, but praying to himself, really is what he's doing. So hopefully that answers the rest of your question, Noah. When we're praying, we're, we're pouring out ourselves to God. Not, we're not in prayer puffing ourselves up. We're pouring ourselves out, not puffing ourselves up. Okay? The Pharisee was doing it all wrong. But look at the tax collector. Who was he counting on? Verse 13. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Whose resources were the tax collector counting on? The tax collector was counting on somebody else's resources. Who were they? Himself. Yeah. Not, the, not the tax collector. The Pharisee was. He was counting on God, wasn't he? Look at his prayer. I don't know if you noticed this. Look at this prayer in verse 13. Sometimes you feel like, you know what, I just, I'm not sure really what to pray. 
and maybe in a group setting, like you want to pray out loud, and it's there, and you're just like, but I don't even, I don't really know what to pray. Look at the prayer in verse 13. I don't know if you caught this up to this point. Here's his prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's it. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What is that, seven words? Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. That's it. All he could do was beat his own chest and, and, and call out to God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That was his prayer. But what he's doing there at the end of verse 13 is counting on God's mercy. It's a good thing to count on, by the way. David said in Psalm 51, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Plural, mercies. That means that God doesn't have just one mercy. And if you mess up, he's going to have mercy on you once. It says there that he has a multitude of tender mercies. He's got enough to cover. All of the times that you ask for forgiveness, God's got enough to cover you. So prayer is me. The third point is that the, the, the prayer is me counting on the resources of God. Listen. If you're doing things, if I am doing things without committing them to God in prayer, then I'm counting on myself to do those things, to accomplish those things. If I'm trying to force my way through school, through classes, not understanding my science or my math, or being bored to death by history, then I'm counting on my own resources. Those are the situations where I want to be saying, God, have mercy on me. I'm in science class, and this teacher might as well be speaking Chinese because I don't understand a thing. I don't know what he or she is saying. And Or maybe I'm in math class. Those are the big ones, like science or math. You know, usually like, oh, I hate that, you know. What's your, you know, what's your least favorite subject? Science or math, whichever one, you know, whichever one it is. And then the science people are always like, yeah, science. Math people are like, yeah, math. Right? Some people like history. Who likes history? But those are those situations where you want to be counting on God's resources, not on your own. Not on your own. Now, let's ask the next question. Let's move right along here. How should I pray? I know that I'm supposed to pray. I know why I'm supposed to pray, but if I'm going to pray, how should I pray? Well, look at verses 11 and 12. Again, this is the corrupt way to pray or the prideful prayer. This is the wrong way. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. And he says God, but he was not talking to God. He prayed thus with himself. It was all about him. That's the wrong way to pray. So how should I pray? Well, notice the correct way in verse 13. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Notice, take note of his posture, first of all. Look at this. He was standing afar off. That speaks of, you know what, he's, he feels guilt, he feels shame, he feels the weight of his sin. Being a tax collector, he's ripping people off all day and he knows it. And then he makes his way at the end of the day to the temple to go and pray and beg for God's mercy. Standing afar off. He doesn't go up close. He gets there and arrives and he looks and the Pharisees are all up front. Standing, hands lifted, praying, their, their gorgeous robes on, all of their religious garb. And he sees himself, I'm a tax collector, nobody likes me. Maybe he goes in and has no friends in there. And he won't even go close. His posture is one that he's standing afar off. But secondly, he would not even raise his eyes. He's so ashamed to look at God, to look up. He beat his breast, beat his breast. This is a picture of a person who's trying to beat the sin out of himself. You know, you heard, I'm going to beat the snot out of you. He's trying to beat the sin out of him. Got to get it out, beating his breast. 
And then he goes from his posture to his actual prayer, to his words, where he says, be merciful. And then finally, he, he, he understands who he is, and he says, I am a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. That is the correct way. So you have there, first of all, in verses 11 and 12, the corrupt way, and then the correct way. So what do we learn? How should I pray? Again, real simple, with humility. With humility. My, take note, attitude is more important than address. The way that I address God is less important than my attitude with God. If I come to God and I say, oh, holy God, hallelujah, amen, and Jesus, and I've got all the right verbiage, all the Christianese, got it all down. I heard my grandpa pray, and he uses all, you know, 18 of these names for God when he prayed, whatever. Listen, that's, that's fine, that's okay, but my attitude is more important than my address, than the way that I address God. Not your home address, not your email address, okay? But the way that I address God, my attitude is more important. And here we learn that we should, in our prayer, we should come with humility. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Sounds a lot like my prayers. <laughs> What's the next question? When and where should I pray? Okay? When and where should I pray? Well, you don't have to turn there, but you can write these down if you'd like. One of my favorite verses, okay? 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Anybody know what that is? 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Nope. Anybody? Pray without ceasing. Three words. Okay? It's like John 11.35. Anybody know what that one is? Jesus wept. Yes. Jesus wept. That's it. Memory verse. If you're thinking, hey, I, can't, I just can't memorize verses. Yes, you can. John 11.35. Jesus wept. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Okay? So, when and where should I pray? Well, I should pray always. Just pray always. But here's the next one. In 1 Timothy 2.8, he says, I desire, therefore, that the men, again, I think it's safe to put the women in there also. Everybody should be praying. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So everywhere. I should always pray, and I should pray everywhere, especially if I'm in school. Oh, God, help me. Forgive me, please, for not studying for my math test. Please have mercy on me and help me to pass this test. So I'm going to get <laughs> you're like you're like right now like I just claim that in Jesus name <laughs> Pastor Chris prayed it I'm, I'm just claiming it for myself hallelujah I should pray everywhere everywhere I should pray everywhere yes years ago prayer was taken out of the schools but was it really I mean how many of us are still not I mean not me anymore I've been set free hallelujah but how many of you are still in school and praying all the time God help me. Okay? So, I should always pray. I should pray everywhere. The point is this. The point is for me to develop. The goal is for me to develop a life of constant communication with God. Not just at meal times. But in the morning. And in the evening. But not just in the morning and in the evening. But during the day, all throughout my day. Whatever it is that I'm doing, whatever I'm, whatever I might be involved in, one of my, one of my, uh, um, um, how can I put it? My some some of my most fervent times of prayer. That means like intense. Are when I am having some kind of problem at home, and I don't mean problem like with people with my family. I mean like problems with like like my plumbing. Yes, I hey, I fix a lot of things around my house, but plumbing is just not one of those things that I do well. It's just always, some of you might have some experience with plumbing, and it's just it just seems like I always, like I, I turn it, okay, it's tight. Turn on the water, it's dripping. Turn it a little bit more to tighten it, it's spraying. Oh! 
So when I know that I've got some duct tape, is that what you said? Let's put some duct tape on it. Yeah. Some, some of that, uh, that, some of that, uh, uh, that black glue that they sell on TV. Just. Um, but 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 the, this is all, all kidding aside. When I know that I've got to go home, you know, it's, it's like I've got to go back home tonight. So no. When I know that I've got to go home tonight and I've got to go fix the sink, I will spend the day in prayer. Lord, give me wisdom. I pray that you would help me to, uh, you know, only do uh, three trips to the hardware store and not eight like normal. And uh, I pray that you would just give me wisdom as I'm, you know, and I'm telling you, you know, this, this, those have been some times. So, so anywhere, all the time, everywhere, I should be developing a life of constant communication with God. Well, let's ask another very important question that many of you have about prayer. Does God actually hear and answer my prayer? Course. Yes. Yes, sir. The first answer is yes. In Second Chronicles 7, 14 through 15, God says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, he says this, Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ear is attentive to prayer made in this place. Now, hopefully you realize that there are lots and lots of verses that I can pull out, but we would have screens and screens and screens full of different verses. The point is to give you one that you can go back to and say, oh, okay, there is, there is one example of God hearing and answering. Now, does God hear and answer? Here's the second answer. Yes. Although it's often delayed. John chapter 11 has one of my favorite stories of all time. Lazarus is sick. He's a friend of Jesus. Lazarus has two sisters. Poor guy. I had two sisters. Still do. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say hat. <laughs> I've got sisters. Sisters are great. Sisters are fantastic. They really are. Um, but Lazarus, Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And when Lazarus was sick and he was dying, Mary and Martha sent a message to Jesus. And this is what they said. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. You go to read the story, and in verse 6 it says, So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Strange. Mary and Martha say, Hey, you're, you're, our brother Lazarus is sick. The point, the idea is, we know that you can heal. We know that you have... Raise people from the from from the dead, or, or uh, um, you've you've um, uh, uh, healed people that were already dead. Uh, Jairus' little girl, and different people, and you've you've healed the blind, and you've healed the deaf. We know that you can do it, so we're just letting you know that. So Jesus hears that his friend is sick, and he stays two more days in the place where he was. What is all that about? It's yes, he answers, but oftentimes it is delayed. And then at the end of that story, in John chapter 11, it says, So when Jesus came, so Jesus finally showed up, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. By the time he shows up to see his friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, Lazarus has already been dead and in the tomb for four days. And we go, wait a minute. That's not an answer to prayer. Yes, it is. It just didn't come when Mary and Martha and Lazarus wanted it. It came, the answer came, when Jesus was ready. You guys are going to love the third answer here. Does God hear an answer? Yes. No is an answer. Oh, I hate that one. You ask me a question, and I say, no. That's an answer. It is an answer. It's just not the answer you like. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus is dealing with this gathering demoniac. <laughs> it's like a revolving door, huh? You just got like, shh. It's like 1950s New York Macy's in here. It's like, <laughs> oh, hey. 
<laughs> like, what? You don't know what Macy's is? Uh, so you don't know what Macy's is? <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> don't ever go there. It smells like perfume. Oh, yeah. I definitely go there, there, too. <laughs> no is an answer. In Mark chapter 5, in Mark chapter 5, Jesus has healed what is uh, what has become known as the gathering demoniac. He was he was a man from Gadara, and the guy was in a, just in absolute shambles. His life was absolute chaos. He actually, as Jesus pulls up to the shore, this uh, uh, demon possessed man who had a multitude of demons in him. By the way, it wasn't just one; it was a multitude. He actually comes running at Jesus. He comes out of a tomb. He's living in the tombs, living in a cave. He comes running straight for Jesus. The guy uh, is actually completely naked because he was demon-possessed, had no control. The demons were just absolutely destroying his life. He's got chains around his ankles, around his arms, that have been busted because the demons had filled him with strength. When they tried, when people from the city tried to lock him down, he was able to bust out of it. And he's just, he's absolutely, completely uh, overtaken by demons. But he encounters Jesus. Jesus frees him from the demons. And then this is what happens in Mark chapter 5. And when he got into the boat, that's Jesus. When Jesus got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed, begged him that he might be with him. In other words, the man that was demon-possessed said, Jesus, please, let me go. He's begging. Let me go with you. That is a request. It's a prayer. Please let me go with you. However, Jesus did not permit him. What? Jesus didn't answer his prayer. Why wouldn't Jesus answer his prayer? And by the way, while we're on the topic, why wouldn't Jesus answer my prayer? Glad that you asked, because in verse 19 it says, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed, the man that used to be demon-possessed, he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. You see, if Jesus had allowed the man to get in the boat and go with him, no one would have ever heard his story. And there are times when you and I are praying for something. God, just free me. Please get me out of this mess. I'm in trouble. I just, I don't know how I got into it. It's not my fault. Please get me out of it. And you're praying and you're praying and you're asking the leaders to pray and you're asking your parents to pray and you're asking friends to pray and God won't set you free. Maybe you feel like, man, I don't think God's really hearing me or answering me. He hears you and he's answering you. What he's saying is no or not yet. Because it may be that he wants to change your life through those circumstances and use you as an example of, to everybody that's watching you go through it. I remember when my youngest daughter, Phoebe, I talk about her often, uh, she was playing soccer, played club soccer. She was, she was very good and uh, got picked up on some club soccer teams. And um, there was this one team that she was on and she was not getting any play time. And we said, hey, let's just, let's just pray. And then it went on, didn't get play time went on, didn't get playtime. And people started to notice from the team, the other girls. Started to weigh on her. She's just a little kid, just a little girl. Started to weigh on her. And we continued to pray. Continued to pray. I can't tell you how many people after that, parents and teammates, approached her at different times. Said, boy, I don't know how you did that. Like, You know, you were so patient, you know, you just hung in there and you just kept training and just working. Eventually she got some playtime, did very, very well. But so many people were encouraged by her sticking with it. As we're praying, saying, God, please give us, you know, give us some answer here. He was answering. He was saying, no, not going to let you have any playtime. You just hang tight. 
I'm going to use you for something bigger than soccer. God does answer, but sometimes he says no. Sometimes it can be, it can be wait, as the second one is. It's often delayed. That's an answer. Lastly, let's finish this up, get out of here for some small group time. Can my prayers be stopped? They can be, sadly. James chapter 1 tells us that they can be stopped by unbelief. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. If I'm, if I'm doubting, I'm not going to get what I'm asking for. What else can stop my prayers? Selfishness. James 4.3 says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Mm. So maybe praying for that Lambo is not the right thing to do. Huh. But God, I'll use it to take my friends to church. It's only got two seats. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know I can drive one, drop them off, speed back, and it. I can pick up like 50 people. Can anything stop my prayers? Yes. Unforgiveness can. Mark 11, 25, and 26 says, And whenever you stand praying, this is going to hurt. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Ouch. There's another thing that can stop my prayers. That's the obvious sin. Isaiah 59.2 says, But your iniquities, your sins, your disobediences, have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. But that would be a terrible way to finish this study, wouldn't it? So, we finish with 1 John 1.9. This is the one I go to. Many of you have talked to me about different issues and things that you're struggling with, and I'm always going to 1 John 1 9. Always going to 1 John 1 9. Why do I always go to 1 John 1 9? Because it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And don't stop there. And to do what, Jordan? Uh, I don't know. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Preach. Preach. Familiar. Preach it. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means whenever I confess my sins to him, clean slate. What? Just like that? That's what it says. Sometimes I've shared this with some of you and you've been like, just like that? That's what it says. I didn't say it. That's what it says. So don't go away from here thinking, man, my prayers are being stopped because, you know, maybe, maybe there are some things that you're guilty of here. The unbelief, the selfishness, the unforgiveness, maybe it's sin. But the good news is, as you leave, for you and I, that all I have to do is confess it to God. And he'll forgive me. And he'll cleanse me. New start. Incredible. Prayer is power. And many of us are missing out on that power. Many of us are living, our, our, our Christian lives are suffering. Or they're weak or we're struggling because we're not praying. So let's get at it, right? Let's get at it.